In this video, we're going to have a look at the solution to the March challenge, which was created by Moz. Usually, these XSS challenges say that we need to execute arbitrary JavaScript and pop an alert with like document.domain. But in this case, it actually says we need to execute an alert 1337. So that's worth bearing in mind. Apart from that, as usual, we'll draw some winners at the end of the competition. We've actually added a first blood prize now. So the first person to solve the challenge will get a 100 euro swag voucher. And that is on top of the usual six winners that we'll draw. I've moved over to the challenge page and we've got a contact form where we can put in some information and then a set token form as well. There is no server side source code to download this time because it's a purely client side challenge. So we can actually just go and have a look at the source. I'm going to go into the debugger and have a look at the index.html. You'll see that we've got some JavaScript towards the bottom. And let's start by looking at this run command token function. How you decide to read through this code is really down to personal preference. You might like to just go through it line by line and see what's actually happening when the script executes, or you might want to try and look for the dangerous function in here. So our goal is clearly going to be to eval this command, and then we can basically trace back through and try and work out what conditions do we need to meet to make sure that what we want to execute is in this command variable by the time it gets evaluated. And if we do that, we'll see then the first thing is we need to make sure the token is set and it needs to be of length 32. If it is, it is then going to generate the string, which is going to do a two lowercase on the token. And it's going to slice the result into a hash and a command variable, which is using the first 32 characters for the hash and then everything after for the command. Finally, that command will be executed. Before we review the code any further, why don't we set up a breakpoint on line 49 and see what this looks like whenever we set a token. So I'm going to set that to cat and then click input and info and we hit a breakpoint and then I want to step over that line and just see what comes out of it. So you can go over to the console and get a view of that here. We can do str and you can see then we've got this 32 by hash followed by and then we've got the command alert hash. So you can probably imagine what's going to happen here with the slice if we do step over, step over, and go back. And what we're going to have now for our hash is going to be the first 32 characters, which was the hash, obviously. And then the command is going to be alert hash, which means if we click on continue, we're going to get an alert, which is cool. We've already got halfway there. We need to pop an alert with 1337 in it, and we've already popped the alert. So the next thing is to try and work out how we can replace that command with alerts 1337. Unfortunately, we can't modify the token directly because of this function right here, which is hashing our input. So you can see here, handle input token, it is being called down here. So if the token param is set, then it's going to call that function and that function is going to MD5 our input and then it's going to set the token to be that hash. So we don't have any control over that. But there is another form on this page, which is a set contact info form. So if we go and have a look down here, you can see that we can also set these URL parameters for set name, set contact, set value, token, run contact info. And up here, we've got this handle input name function, which is going to take in the name, the contact, the value, and then it's going to set the user object's name to equal those values. And notice that these are user supplyable input but there's no sanitation being done on the values that we provide. According to PortSwigger, if we have user controllable properties being merged into an existing object without first sanitizing the keys, then we have a prototype pollution vulnerability. Let's first of all just try this out with some standard values. So I'm going to go here and say that the name is cat, the contact is email, and let's just say cat at crypto, and then we'll click input, we'll click info, and there we go, it's popped up an alert. Let's go to our console now and see what we've got in for this user object. And notice that we've got the token and then we've got in there, we've got cat, email, and then that's set those values. And what have we got here? The prototype. So if we go back now and try and do this with proto, let's do underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. And then let's set the value that we want to pollute in the prototype to be the token. And then the value that we want to set here, in this case, we want the value to be 1337. Let's click on input, info, and it didn't actually update at all. Let's go back here, user. Okay, so here we have the prototype now, we have the token is set to 1337. However, if I do token here, you can see that's set to null. It's only if we do user 
user.token. In fact, not even user.token is still the original value. It's only if we do user.proto.token, it will come back with 1337. So I just wanted to highlight that distinction because we have prototype pollution vulnerabilities are quite well known, but there are also prototype poisoning vulnerabilities, which have the limitation that the parent object prototypes are immutable. So that means the attacker can only affect the input object and the children that inherit its prototype. So in this example, we were able to modify the prototype of the user object. However, if I go and just do a general proto.token, you'll see that it is undefined because we've only been able to pollute the prototype of that specific object. Now, a couple of things. Obviously, we need to craft a URL that we're going to be able to send to the victim. So we know that whenever we check the debugger, the URL parameters are being taken as get parameters up here. So we can go and fill this in. Let's just go and do the same thing that we have been doing. We can set the set name to be equal to proto, and then we'll set the set contact to be equal to token. That's the what we want to pollute. And then finally, we can set our set value to be 1337. There we go. We run that. We don't get an alert. But if we go back again to our debugger and have a look at the code, we'll see that another condition here was if run token info. Let me see where that was set again. So it takes it from the URL parameters. It's not taking it from anywhere else. So let's go here and also say and run token info equals one. We don't get an alert. And the reason being this time is we didn't actually meet the criteria for the token. So we're manually setting the token to be 1337, but remember it needs to be 32 bytes long. Let's go and verify that. So we had this bit at the start, it's checking the token length, and we know at the moment that if we send this off, I'm just gonna set a breakpoint up there. We set up a breakpoint, and it's gonna to get to this user token.length, and it's gonna say that's four, not 32, and it's gonna reject it. So let's turn that off. And I'll take a copy of the 1337, paste it in a few times. Run it again, and this time we do get an alert. Unfortunately, that is not valid. We do need to get 1337 only. And a lot of people did find some ways around this, like for using URL encoded spaces. So it actually looks like it's 1337, or you could use URL encoded null bytes. Um, and I'm sure there was a lot of different possibilities here, but we do actually need this to be 1337 only. So this is where our next vulnerability comes in. Let's go back to our code again and have a look at this line. So the str is being set and at the end it's being converted to lowercase. Perhaps you stumbled upon an article like this, weaponizing Unicode for fun and profit, which has an example on case mapping collisions. It says that some Unicode characters are vulnerable to case mapping collisions when two different characters are uppercased or lowercase into the same character. And it gives an example, whereas in this case, we've got a beta character, which when converted to uppercase will result in SS, so two ASCII characters. And that's not too much use for us, but there is another example, which when converted to lowercase will produce an I. So this is like a weird uppercase looking I, but if we take it to Cyberchef and paste it in here, then convert it to hex, Notice that this is actually two bytes, whereas if we look at a lowercase i, it's one byte. What does that mean? Well, if we go back to our form, in fact, let's open up our debugger again and have a look at the code. So it's this slice operation that we're interested in. It's gonna go through here, it's gonna to check to make sure the token is 32 characters long. So if we were to provide 16 of those Unicode i's, and then our 16 byte payload is gonna meet this criteria. It'll get through to the next part. It'll be converted to lowercase. And whenever it's converted, those 16 I's are gonna be expanded to 32 characters long. And that's gonna be the hash then. It's gonna trim the first 32 characters. And then the remaining 32 characters will become the command. Let's give it a go. I've taken a copy of that I. Let me just remove all of this stuff that's in here. Okay, so there's four of them. Let's do 16. And then we want to do our alerts. So I'll do alerts 1337. Now, if we try and hit enter, nothing's going to come up. And why is that? Well, it's not actually 32 characters now. We've got 16, and then we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 21, and then 6. So we've got 27 characters. So we need to put in another five characters. I'm going to do 
a slash slash and then cat because that's just going to comment out the cat and it'll be perfectly valid JavaScript, but it will give us the alert. So that was the intended solution. We didn't really get any unintended solutions, but I'll just highlight a couple of things. One is that many people did write a script to find out the valid character. This one is one from ZPacifist and it will print out the valid character. So it looks like actually that uppercase I was the only possibility that we could use for this attack. Apart from that, some players were able to execute arbitrary JavaScript and pop that alert document.domain. Most people didn't do this because there was the restriction where you needed the 16 byte payload, but here's an example from Mysterican where they basically import the script from nj.rs. And if I hit enter on that, notice that it first pops up with these eyes and then it pops up with the alert document.domain. And if we go here and have a look at the network tab, we'll see that, yeah, it made a call to nj.rs. And if we have a look at what that came back with, it basically has a JavaScript alert document domain payload already in it. There was a couple of different variations of how to execute arbitrary JavaScript in this challenge. So I'd encourage you to check out the community write-ups and check out our Git book because we're going to try to break down some of the player submitted payloads and statistics for challenges like this. There wasn't really any unintended solutions this time, so there's not too much to add there, but I would encourage you to check it out anyway. Anyway, this has been the solution to the Integrity March challenge. It involved XSS, obviously, prototype pollution or prototype poisoning, and a Unicode case mapping collision. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, as ever, leave them down below. Thanks.